Hey everybody, do you have an extension cord like this that's maybe got a little bit of damage to the end? Maybe it's lost a grounding pin because you were trying to plug it into an outlet that didn't have a grounding pin, so you yanked it out of there with pliers, don't do that. Or perhaps you've got a pet who's decided that the plug from your favorite lamp is their new chew toy. Bad dog. Or maybe you lent it to a buddy and they wanted to put it up somewhere to temporarily hold it for a party and they used a staple gun to attach it and well, they missed a few times. Yeah, don't do that either. Or maybe it just has some abrasion on the insulation that's damaged it and now you can see the conductors that are inside and maybe it's uh, had a little bit of heat damage. Well, at any rate, whatever the damage is to the extension cord, one of the best ways to repair it and to salvage what's left of the cord is to just simply replace the ends. So in this video, I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to repair an extension cord. Let's get started. I'd like to start by discussing the various types of replacement ends that you can purchase. If you go to your local hardware store, you'll find most likely that they've got a variety to choose from, and it can be a little bit tricky to figure out exactly what you need. There's quite a bit of variability both in the price range and in what these things are rated for, so pay pretty close attention to what you're buying. For instance, if you're replacing the end on an outdoor rated extension cord that's good for, say, 20 amps, you won't want to replace it with the smallest, cheapest end you can find at that hardware store because it's probably not rated for outdoor use and most likely is not rated for that much current either. So pay attention to what you're replacing and make sure that you're buying the right thing. All right, let's talk about the tools we're gonna to need for this project. The first is a Phillips screwdriver like this. Nothing special, just a basic Phillips should work just fine. Next, you're gonna need a pair of wire cutters and strippers. Now, if you don't already have a pair of like this, then I highly recommend you just go ahead and invest in a pair. They're really useful to have around the house for household electrical work, and they're really not very expensive. And finally, you're gonna need a sharp knife of some kind. I'm gonna be using this retractable razor blade, but any razor blade or sharp pocket knife even would work just great. And if you need any of these tools, I'll leave links down in the description below. So for demonstration purposes, I bought a variety of different ends at my local hardware store, and I wanna go over some of the important distinctions and differences between them, so you know kinda of what to look for when you're going to buy the end that you need for your cord. For instance, here in North America, there are basically two kinds of plugs that will be most commonly repaired this way. The first is referred to as a NEMA 1-15, and it only has two prongs, one for the hot and one for the neutral wire. This is typically used on small appliances like lamps or fans, clocks, radios, battery chargers, that sort of thing. The other uses three prongs and is called a NEMA 5-15. This connector uses the hot, the neutral, and the ground wires, and this is the most common type of end on an extension cord. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to replace both the NEMA 1-15, or the two-prong, and the NEMA 5-15, or the three-prong plugs, which, again, are the most common types you'll encounter in most of North America. Also, note that both the male and the female versions of these plugs are commonly available, so you can repair either end of a damaged cord. Now, you'll want to pay close attention when you're looking at the various three-pronged options that are available at your local hardware store, because they are not all the same. For instance, this next example is stamped NEMA 6-20R. This is a completely different configuration on the front. It's not a 5-15. You can see that it looks similar, but it is in fact different. This is rated for 20 amps at 250 volts, which is commonly used by appliances with a higher current need, such as an air conditioner, an oven, or an air compressor, that sort of thing. You'll find that a 5-15 will not fit into it at all, and that is by design to protect you from accidentally plugging a device rated for 120 volts into a socket that provides 250, or vice versa. So pay very close attention that you are purchasing the correct type of plug for your specific repair. You'll notice that all replacement connectors should have their type and ratings stamped into the outer jacket or their casing so that you can double check to make sure that you're getting the right thing. There are a lot of other more obscure standards for plugs, and I'll leave a link to some of those resources down below the like button if you want to learn more. In general, there are two types of connections that you'll be making inside of these plugs. The first involves wrapping the wire around a screw and then tightening the screw down to squeeze it and make a good connection. The second involves inserting the conductor between two small plates that are then squeezed together with a screw. 
I'll demonstrate both of these in detail a bit later in this video, and if you find a different style connector inside the end that you're replacing, I recommend you consult the manufacturer's instructions. All right, let's go over how to wire a NEMA 1-15 plug replacement. As I mentioned, these are the plugs that only have the two prongs or conductors. One is for the hot wire, and one is for the neutral. It's easy to mix up which wire goes where, so pay close attention to the jacket around the conductors of the cord that you're repairing. The neutral wire will typically have raised ridges or bumps along the outer edge of the outside insulation. The hot wire will be smooth. Be careful not to mix these up, as some appliances may not function correctly or could possibly become dangerous with the connections reversed. Here's a small desk lamp with a damaged plug. After verifying that I'm using the correct replacement plug type, I'll start by cutting off the old plug, including any damaged area. Then simply pull the two conductors apart with my fingers, making sure that I don't separate them too far down the wire as I only need about an inch and a half or so. Next, with my wire strippers, I'm gonna remove about a half inch or so of the insulation around the conductor. Then I like to twist the fine strands of copper together as that will help the wire stay nice and tidy in the next steps. With our damaged wire all prepared, next I'm gonna remove the screw that holds the two halves of the replacement plug together and open the plug body like a clamshell. Inside, you'll find two screws. One is a gold color, and that is for the hot wire, and the other is a silver color, which is for the neutral. For all of the plugs that I'll be demonstrating today, gold is always for hot, and silver is always for neutral. As I mentioned earlier, on a wire like this that only has the two conductors in it, one of them will have some ridges on the outside of the insulation, which will be designated for the neutral side. The side that goes to the hot is just going to be very smooth on the outside. So in this example, the wire with the ridges is going to go to the silver screw, and the wire that is smooth is going to go to the gold screw. To make the connections, bend the wire into a small hook shape, and then place it around the barrel of the screw. Now, I've purposely done this incorrectly for this example, as I want to demonstrate the most common error that people make when replacing plugs like this. You should wrap the wire around the screw in a clockwise direction, but right now in this demonstration I've wrapped it counterclockwise, which will have a tendency to unwrap the wire and force the conductor out of the joint as I tighten down the screw. As you can see, this makes a pretty poor connection, and a dangerous one at that, as there is a lot of extra copper conductor that's pushed out of the connection joint, where it may possibly touch the other conductor and cause a short circuit. So now let me demonstrate the right way to do this. Again, we'll start with a little hook shape in the wire, but this time when we place it behind the head of the screw, we'll be very careful to make sure that it's going to wrap clockwise around the barrel of the screw. Then, as we tighten down the screw, the conductor will stay wrapped nice and tightly around the screw, resulting in a strong and safe connection. Repeat this process for the other side, and then with the wiring finished, you're now ready to close up the plug body. Now notice that there's a small hole in the middle of the body, and this is for the screw that holds the two halves together. There are some small channels molded into the plug to route the wires away from this hole so you don't accidentally put the screw through the wires. Make sure that you've routed the wires correctly and then carefully close the two halves of the clamshell. And notice that they don't quite seem to close all the way. Now this is by design and is expected. When you put the screw in, it will tighten up the two halves, clamping down on the insulation of your cord and ensuring a strong mechanical connection and also providing some strain relief for the electrical connections inside. Okay, with this plug replaced, let's plug it in and test out the lamp. And it looks like it works perfectly, so this repair is complete. One other quick two-pronged example. If your replacement plug is set up to remove the face to make the connections rather than in a clamshell shape, you'll want to route the wires like this. See how the hot is coming up and around the hot and then around the screw? And the neutral is coming up around the back side and then gets wrapped around the neutral screw. That's the most secure and safest way to do this. Let's move on to another example, this time with a NEMA 5-15 or the three-pronged plug. As before, we're going to cut off the damaged end of the cord, making sure that we move far enough down that we don't have any damaged area remaining. With the cord cut, you can see that it has several different layers of insulation. The outer layer, which is orange, is really just wrapped all the way around to hold the three conductors together. Now each of the three conductors inside also have their own layers of insulation. We'll start by removing a short section of the orange outer insulation. You only need to take off about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Very carefully and very lightly score the outside of the jacket with a razor blade or very sharp knife. Be careful you don't cut all the way through as it's very easy to cut through the insulation 
and wind up cutting into the conductors that are inside. Then if you simply pull on the outer jack of insulation, it should tear pretty easily where you've scored it, and that will then reveal the inner conductors without any damage to their insulation. Notice that we still have some color coding going on. The black is gonna be your hot wire, white will be the neutral, and green is gonna be ground. And this is pretty universal in all extension cords that I've ever repaired, and it's probably pretty universal across most of North America. Just like with the two-prong plug, we'll strip off about a half inch or so of insulation on these conductors. And again, I like to twist the strands together to keep things tidy. Next, we'll open up our plug. This particular design has screws in the face rather than the clamshell. Next, feed the backside of your plug body onto the cable and retwist the wires if anything gets disturbed. We'll slide that down out of the way. And now we're ready to start making our connections. You can see this screw has a little bit of a green color. That'll be for the ground. This one is silver, that's for neutral. And this gold one is gonna be for the hot. And again, black is hot, white is neutral, green is ground. So decide which wire you're gonna start with. I think I'll start with my hot, that's the black one. And I'll start by just pushing this into the connector and I can see that I've cut this just a little bit long. See how I've got some extra copper that's showing outside of where the conductor is. I don't really want that. So I'm gonna use my wire cutters to trim off a little bit of that extra of that conductor. Okay, with that cut a little bit shorter, let's check and see how well that fits. That's much better. See how the insulation comes right up to the edge of the screw? That's perfect. So now I can go ahead and just tighten down this screw. With the connections complete, I'm just gonna double check that my ground wire, which is green, has gone to my ground lug, which is also green. My neutral wire, which is white, has gone to my silver lug. And the hot wire, which is black, has gone to the gold one. Those are all correct, so I'm ready to close this up. You'll notice if you look inside the body, there are some slots that correspond to the various cutouts and slots that are on the face. It may take a little bit of kajiggering to figure out exactly how this goes together, but it will only fit together one direction to keep everything oriented correctly. Make sure the slots line up. Then tighten up the screws that are in the face. And the last step is really important. Don't forget to do this. This silver piece here is designed to clamp onto the outer insulation layer of this cord. This is gonna provide strain relief so that if you pull on the cord, you're not actually pulling on those connections inside. So, again, just using a Phillips screwdriver, you'll tighten these down. Now don't do all of one side and then do all of the other side. Do a little bit on one side, switch to the other side, clamp down a little bit there, and then switch back to the first. Going back and forth, tightening it down kind of gradually. This helps it to center things a little bit better and winds up with a little stronger connection, I think. Okay, that's now squeezing nice and strong and providing a really secure connection, so this cord is repaired. So here are the last two examples I wanted to show, and I'm doing them together because they're basically exactly the same thing. One just happens to be the receptacle side and one happens to be the plug side. The interesting thing about these though is that they light up to indicate that there is power available for the extension cord. So when you plug this side into a wall outlet, there's a little light that turns on inside here. And if you have this on the other end of your extension cord, then without being anywhere close to the outlet, you can tell whether the extension cord is plugged in. It's kind of handy, but they are a little bit more expensive. This is what I'm gonna be using to replace the ends that have been damaged on my extension cord today. So let's open this one up and I'll show you how to wire it as well. Once you've separated the two halves and cut away the damaged area of the cord, the first thing I recommend you do is feed this cord into the back half. Now you'll notice this is gonna be a pretty tight fit and if you can't quite get it to feed through, you may need to loosen these two screws. And I like to slide this back half down out of the way so I've got room to work on this end of the cord. Now preparing the extension cable to install these ends is exactly the same as the prior three prong example I already provided. So if you've skipped ahead to this portion of the video to see how to put on lighted ends, you might wanna back up quickly just to where I put on the other three prong end to see how to prepare the cable. But briefly, you just need to remove about an inch or so of the outer insulation jacket from the extension cord and then strip back a short section of insulation from each of the hot, neutral, and ground wires. Okay, with that insulation stripped, all you need to do is loosen up these screws to make enough room for the conductor to fit in behind where the screws clamp down. 
Once you've loosened the screws, you'll see that there's this little part here. You want to make sure that this has been pulled out to be flush with the screw, and the hole that results right there is exactly where you want to put the wire. That first one is for the neutral. And next we'll do the ground. And then finally we'll do the hot. So now that the wiring connections are finished, we can reassemble the body of the plug. You can see it's got this little section here that's a little longer, a little ear there. As you rotate this around, you'll see there's a cutout that that slots into. So just line things up properly. And then your screw holes will all fit just like they're supposed to. Once the screws on the face are nice and tight, it's time to tighten down these two screws here which will clamp onto the outer insulation jacket of the extension cord and prevent some strain from happening and pulling those connections back out. And make sure you've got the insulation going all the way through this clamping section. One other nice thing about these clear ones is that you can clearly see that the orange insulation is extending well up beyond where I'm clamping right now. And do these a little bit at a time on each side. When you're done, it should be nice and tightly pinching the outer jacket of the extension cord, just like that. Okay, this one is repaired, let's give it a test. So here are the repaired ends of this cord, and you can see when I plug it in, both ends light up to let me know that there's power available, and that this cord is ready to use. One last thing I'd like to mention is this little tool here. This is an outlet tester. And if you're gonna be doing any kind of electrical work around your home, I really recommend that you get your hands on one of these. They're not that expensive, maybe 10 or $15. I picked this one up at my local hardware store, but I'll leave links in the description to a couple that I found online that are also great options. These are really easy to use. You just plug this end into the outlet that you've been working on, whether that's a wall outlet or an extension cord like this. And it has these lights down the side that will light up to indicate whether you have wired it correctly or if you've got another problem like an open ground, an open neutral, or you reversed some things. This particular one also lets you test for GFCI operation with this little button here, but we're not gonna be doing that today. I just wanna plug this into this extension cord that I've just repaired and make sure that it lights up that it's wired correctly, and it does. So this extension cord is now ready to be put back into service. All right, well, that's gonna do it for this one. I hope you've enjoyed this video and maybe even learned a little something. If you thought I did a good job, you can let me know about that with the thumbs up button down below. And if you've got any comments or questions or suggestions for something I could have done different or better, you can let me know about that in the comments section as well. Now, I'm coiling this up using a technique I learned from, well, the essential craftsman. And I'll leave a link to his video down below. I know it uh, might look like it's a bit of a snarled, tangled up mess, but Trust me, this is the best way to store your extension cords. They never tangle again. Thanks for watching and have a great day. You gotta get lower. Yeah.